I hate to break this to you, but money isn't actually made of paper, which also proves that money doesn't actually grow on trees. Most banknotes are 25% linen and 75% cotton, which is why they have such a distinct look and feel. Back in the 19th century, money was made of parchment paper. That's why people could easily counterfeit it. Unlike now, the Eiffel Tower is almost 6 inches taller during the summer. When you heat up some substance, its particles start to move more actively and take up a bigger volume. That's something they call thermal expansion. When the temperature lowers, the substance contracts again. Such an effect is more prominent in gases, but you can also track it in liquids and solids, including iron. If you make a snowball and try to set it on fire using your lighter, the thing won't melt. The snow will first turn black, then it'll start to vanish, but you'll get no water. There's nothing supernatural about this phenomenon. The snow is melting, but you don't see it because the structure of the snowflakes. They kind of wick away the melted water, and it gets absorbed by the remaining relatively loose-packed snowball. Our moon used to have an atmosphere. Several volcanic eruptions happened on Earth's natural satellite around 4 billion years ago. They released immense volumes of gas, trillions of tons. It was so much that the gas didn't have enough time to escape into space. That's how an atmosphere was formed. Just like a chicken egg, an ostrich egg will contain a chick embryo only if the egg was first fertilized by a male ostrich. Otherwise, you'll only find whites and a huge yolk inside of it. The size of the yolk is equal to around 24 chicken yolks, so one ostrich eggs can easily feed a squad of 10 people. But ostrich eggs aren't all that edible. Those who tried them say that they taste a lot like chicken eggs, fatty, buttery, and kind of sweet. But the flavor is more intense. They're also richer in magnesium and iron than chicken eggs, but contain fewer vitamins A and E. One ostrich egg will give you about 2,000 calories, while the average chicken egg only contains 75 calories. Cooking and eating them is a chore, so you'll unlikely have them for breakfast every day. Their shell is extremely thick. You can step on eggs with both of your feet and they won't break. That's why if you want to cook an omelet using an ostrich egg, you're going to need a drill or a hammer, and also a really big skillet to fit an egg of that size. No bigger. Yeah, like that. Boiling the egg will take almost 90 minutes. Not so long ago, scientists decided that dinos' family trees had to be redrawn for the first time in 130 years. Apparently, two species of dinosaurs had to be grouped together from the very beginning. Those were the lizard-hipped meat-eaters like T-Rex and bird-hipped vegetarians such as the Stegosaurus. People are still evolving. Scientists have been tracking several millions of human anomalies. It turns out, some harmful genes are slowly but surely getting filtered out of human DNA. Sound travels almost four times faster underwater than it does in the air. That's why divers often have problems with figuring out the direction of sound. Bananas contain potassium, and this element is slightly radioactive. On the bright side, you need to eat 10 million bananas before radiation can negatively affect you. Meanwhile, out in space, shadows are darker on the moon than on our planet. That's because the atmosphere on Earth scatters more sunlight. But if you could visit the moon, you'd observe shadows so dark, you wouldn't be able to see where you were going. Also, you'd notice fresh footprints on the lunar surface. People haven't set foot there in a few decades, but the footprints look as if they were left just yesterday. Since there's no water or wind on the moon, nothing can erase these footprints, so they can stay there in their original form for millions of years. Sure, if you were about to go to space, one of the first things you would think of would be your spacesuit. But did you know that it's possible to survive in space even if you aren't wearing any protection? Well, don't get your hopes up yet. You'd last for no more than 15 seconds. That's how long it would take you to lose consciousness because oxygen will stop coming to your brain. The ocean performs many functions. For one thing, it produces 50 to 80% of all the oxygen on our planet, which means it keeps us alive. But it also helps the internet to function. So when you're laughing at a funny dog video or binge watching your favorite series, yep, thank the ocean for that. Disneyland's airspace has the protection level of the White House and the Kennedy Space Center. It's prohibited to fly over the theme park without a special waiver. The restriction was introduced in 2003 for security reasons. 
So now you will never see a plane or even a single drone flying over the park. How about a butter applicator in the form of a glue stick? With this invention, making sandwiches in the morning will become so much easier. The main challenge is to not confuse it with a real glue stick. Bacon Lip Balm is a great addition to those butter sticks. This product is already being sold online. Imagine rubbing your lips with a piece of fried bacon before going out. Not really my thing, but you do you. Bananas are delicious and convenient. Thanks to their dense skin, they won't break when you carry them with you. But for some people, this natural protection doesn't seem to be enough. They don't like brownish marks on the yellow peel. Especially for them, one of the main inventions of the 21st century. This is a banana suitcase. The container will protect your banana from the dangers following it everywhere. How can you get your cat to work off the money you spend on its food? Let it clean the room while you're away. Japanese engineers came up with cat duster slippers. The cat walks on the floor and rids your home of dust at the same time. But I'm not sure your pet will like the idea. Hugs are very beneficial to health. They relieve stress and help your body produce endorphins, the hormone of happiness. The image of a happy girl in the Wendy's logo was inspired by the daughter of the fast food chain's creator, Dave Thomas. Wendy is her nickname. If you look closer, you'll notice her collar spells out the word mom. Whether intentional or not, it became something to mean a homely feel the restaurant gives its guests. 941, set as the time in iPhone's ads, isn't a random choice of numbers. In 2007, Steve Jobs first introduced the iPhone to the public after a 41-minute presentation at exactly 9.41 a.m. The first Apple logo was designed in 1976 and featured Sir Isaac Newton sitting under a tree with an apple about to fall on his head. It seemed too complex and unclear to many, so Steve Jobs wanted it replaced. Some people have a fear of technology, a.k.a. technophobia. Now, it mostly has to do with complex new devices like computers. But it has its roots back in the time of the Industrial Revolution. It began in the 18th century when workers were afraid new machines would take their jobs. The founders of Domino's were originally planning to add a dot to the Domino's in the logo for every new place they opened. But it was growing way too fast and too big for that. So they decided to keep just three dots for the three original locations. Ah, Earth. The third rock from the sun. The blue planet. You get it. Its atmosphere is made up of around 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% argon, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. A nice balance for any living creatures to breathe. The weather here is also perfect for life to exist, unlike places like Saturn, Mercury, or any other celestial object in our solar system. We have the troposphere to thank for that. It's the densest part of the atmosphere on our planet and is 5 to 9 miles wide. It's the layer of the atmosphere that always affects our weather and secures the right conditions for life to exist and to have bodies of water. Earth is just sitting in its orbital path, minding its own business, revolving around the sun, until BAM! Venus and Mars swoop in and spoil the fun. No one wants to leave poor Earth alone. These two relatively large celestial objects moving toward Earth will have dire consequences for our planet starting with changes in its orbiting trajectory path. The planet's orbits in the solar system have to maintain the right balance so that nothing goes haywire. Of course, if any large object approaches Earth, it would throw our orbiting path off course. The planets will revolve around each other, which will cause plenty of natural disasters on our lanes. This will also affect our rotation timing, potentially slowing it down. Days will not flow, but drag by animals that rely on daytime will need to readjust their biological clocks. Nocturnal animals will also need to figure out how to cope with the long nights. Humans have adjusted pretty well to the 24 hours a day timing. Time itself is just a human construct to measure things. We'll have a tough time sleeping and adjusting to the stretched day. Marine animals rely on the natural current flow to migrate around the oceans. With Mars and Venus crashing the party, it looks like they will also need to find new paths. Birds migrating to other lands throughout the year will also be confused and not know what to do. In general, the Earth's temperature will rise, and massive heat waves and permanent climate changes will occur. 
This brings us to our next issue, the heat. The radical temperature rise will turn everything into a barren desert. It'll be summer all year long, especially if Venus is in the picture. Most of the planet will dry up and won't be suitable for growing crops. Venus is hot, I mean really hot. Even though it's not the closest planet to the sun, it's still the hottest. The temperatures on Venus are close to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, which will melt you like an ice cube. The lands on Venus are generally flat, probably due to the temperatures. It's mainly hot because its atmosphere is thick and traps the hazardous gases inside. If Venus inches its way towards us, it'll invite those gases to our atmosphere and compromise it. Mars, or the red planet as we know it, is very cold. That might stay the same if it starts rotating around us. It's also home to the largest dormant volcano in our solar system, which makes Mount Everest look like a tiny bush compared to a tree. With so much instability, it might just wake up one day and spew out molten lava. Mars has a very thin atmosphere, which makes the planet chilly. Its gravity is quite similar to ours. It's actually very cold and has ice caps in the poles covered with carbon dioxide. The same is true for Mercury. You can only last there as long as you can hold your breath and be in the sweet spot between the sunrise and sunset. The three planets orbiting each other will eventually collide. It's just a matter of time. And the moon, just hanging out like a fly on the wall, will be so insignificant that something will eventually throw it off course and another planet will capture it to its orbit. Or, in the most dire case, it will collide with one of the two intruding planets. Earth will experience extreme tidal waves like nothing before. The two new planets revolving around Earth will cause a major imbalance, making our gravity shift out of control. Each tidal wave will be bigger than the previous one and will cover the dry land. Plenty of little scattered islands in the oceans will be completely submerged. Coastal cities and towns will also be home to fish. Flat countries in general will need boats to get around. Dams and dikes won't be enough to stop the water from coming in. Everyone needs to move towards higher ground to escape the floods. With the climate getting hotter, the polar caps will melt like ice cream on a sweltering summer day and add to the water level rising. Within a few months, the whole Arctic will be nothing but liquid. But wait, there's more! The crust will wear out due to the instability of the Earth's surface and fluctuating gravity. The Earth's crust is mainly made up of oxygen, which means we're basically walking on air. We might experience more earthquakes than before, and dormant volcanoes will wake up from their deep slumber. The skies will be covered in ash, making flights impossible. No one can travel by sea or by air. Importing and exporting will become history. The overall climate will get hotter, just like in Venus. The three planets orbiting each other and their huge mass might even unintentionally welcome other planets and celestial bodies to join the party. So, what if Jupiter decided to turn up? Now, Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. To give you an idea, the Earth would be just the size of a grape if Jupiter were the size of a basketball. It also has the largest storm we can perceive. That's known as the Red Spot, a place twice the size of Earth that has hurricane-like storms that have been going on for hundreds of years. Now, by the time you're done watching this video, you can expect the storm to still be going at it. Since the planet is huge, gravity must be quite strong here. It also has many moons, some of them of our little Earth. There will be no room for any proper space among the planets. Jupiter's moons will be thrown off course and latch onto other planets around. Some of the moons might collide with each other, causing massive debris to be displaced all over the place. The gravity of the planetary party will attract comets to enter the atmosphere, potentially crashing down on us. Oxygen levels will deplete, so the Earth's crust crumbling will continue. It'll rip open the ozone layer, causing heavy strokes of ultraviolet waves to enter our atmosphere. We won't be able to step outside for too long without some protective gear and oxygen tanks. Human civilization will change drastically. We'll all live in sheltered containers that will provide clean air and safe and filtered sun rays. The shelters will be sturdy enough to withstand frequent earthquakes. We will grow only enough crops to sustain ourselves until we leave the Earth. 
Since it'll only be a matter of time before the planets collide, the next step would be to create large rocket ships to fly us out of the Earth. With Mars, Venus, and Jupiter revolving close to us, it won't be easy to do so. All the space debris will be blocking us from exiting the space zone area. The only safe place outside this region will be many millions of miles away, where only single planets exist. They may or may not have the conditions to host life, but humans will have the technology to land just about anywhere with similar gravity and construct the right shelters. Eventually, Mars, Venus, Earth, and Jupiter will collide with each other and break like eggs, like a big space omelet. Don't forget the moon's crashing and breaking in the mix, but we'll already be far, far away by then, hopefully. How much would a pinch of sand be worth to you? How about without the elements of gold or platinum mixed into it, just moon dust? A recent auction sold it for half a million dollars, for literally just a pinch of what's on the moon. But this apparently valuable minuscule amount of dirt was valued purely on its historical relevance. That pinch of sticky moon sand was from a small pouch that was collected by Neil Armstrong on the Apollo 11 mission in 1969. It was a huge piece of human history and a physical reminder of when man first landed on the moon, something taken from a place that no one else has ever been able to. Selling something from the moon opens a whole new debate around the legality of owning, using, and selling space resources from unclaimed parts of the solar system. Currently, the world abides by the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, which depicts the foundations of modern space law. This treaty, established so long ago, didn't predict the lucrative use of outer worlds for resource utilization. Although this treaty prevents anyone from claiming ownership of any new worlds, the potential value of these unclaimed territories is priceless. The moon is not only a stepping stone for future exploration into outer space, from which moon bases and possibly moon cities will one day thrive. For this purpose, humans will need to develop shipping bays and factories to support carriers to cross into new worlds. This project will need some good investments. Mining stations will provide the economy of the hypothetical moon city. There will be infrastructure and transportation to the moon and back again. All of this will cost a lot, way more than a reminder of when man first walked on the moon. So apart from moon dust, what else could be valuable on the moon? There is value in the resources on the moon. We don't know the exact numbers, but it's estimated that there is more than was thought in the past. The Earth's natural satellite is believed to be abundant with iron, nickel, and cobalt, amongst many more. These minerals provide the potential for building Moon City itself. Just as in human history, cities around the world are a reflection of what resources are in abundance in their surroundings, and Moon City will be the same in that way. A gray city, walls made with metal, iron dust, and a lunar sand concrete with great windows made from the unlimited sand available. The moon is also rich in silicon, an important ingredient in producing solar panel arrays. There's calcium to be used to fabricate the silicon-based solar cells, along with other ingredients found there, like titanium oxide, iron, and aluminum. The long dormant lunar magma ocean residing under its surface holds magnesium. It's especially prominent within the lower crust and is useful for many purposes, most importantly for alloys with expected space travel. The production of steel requires many sources of carbon, crucially important for supporting the mega factories and for the many thousands of ships that will be built. Numerous rare earth materials are used in everything electrical. They continue to be more valuable and their production is more prominent as technology progresses, especially in electric vehicles and wind turbines. Although rare earth materials are abundant on our planet, you won't find them in many concentrated areas. They are spread thin throughout the earth, so locating and mining them is pretty costly, though they're more required with every year. The process of finding and mining on the moon is far easier and will be an important alternate source. Nitrogen, along with carbon, 
are important elements to support human colonization and farming, and ensure that the moon is not only habitable, but has a constant supply of food. We can obtain them within the moon's outer crust, so farming is possible there within sealed biospheres. Mining metals is a difficult process, but the result is worth it, not only for their value, but also because of the valuable byproducts that you can get in the process of extraction. It can be oxygen, available for breathable air within the city, and hydrogen, to ensure water for the plants and for drinking. Valuable resources will not only come from within the surface of the moon. Its potential for solar power is so huge, it will ensure harvesting the solar waves to power Moon City. The fact that it lacks a thick atmosphere and that there's no interruption of weather patterns removes some major obstacles that are present on Earth. The energy created could be sufficient for all requirements on the Moon and, in the short term, may also help solve many of Earth's power concerns. Extracting resources and manufacturing requirements will be significant as time carries forward. As Moon City is going to grow and humans will reach further into outer space, it will require more and more energy. The output to factories and production on the Moon will become so elaborate that they will need alternate sources in reserve. Atom-powered fusion will be an important source of energy with no dangerous byproduct. It will be safer than the technologies of today that use uranium. Feeding this kind of fusion will require the most valuable of all resources found on the Moon, helium-3. It's not only present on the Moon, but can also be found on Earth. But the amount is super limited here due to our planet's strong magnetic field. It ensures life can thrive on Earth, but at the same time deflects the solar winds from the Sun, making it difficult for helium-3 to be produced. The Moon has no magnetic field and has been absorbing the solar wind for billions of years, constantly building up an endless supply of helium-3 in the process. It absorbs the winds into the top layer of solid material on the Moon, also known as the regolith. The regolith is spread all over the Moon, and it makes the extraction of the helium-3 an even more valuable action. Mining it would also include mining all the other valuable minerals in the process. The value of helium-3 is so substantial that many countries and companies are determined to gain a foothold on the Moon. The value of this alone is within trillions of dollars. Some people believe the opportunities that helium-3 will give humanity are immeasurable. There will be unlimited energy providing millions of jobs in Moon City. That energy will also support the Earth's needs. Only 25 tons of helium-3 could power the United States for an entire year. This resource will provide the potential to power all of Earth for thousands of years and have enough energy required to help guide humans further into space. It will enable the construction of spaceports around Earth and allow for a more efficient journey from Earth to orbit. From there, people will be transferred to shuttles destined for other locations throughout the solar system. The lengths of spaceflight will be reduced significantly, creating more frequent flights toward Mars. Further ports will be erected around its orbit, supporting new colonies to reside on its surface. Mining colonies with the support of endless energy will spread throughout the red planet, with more valuable resources residing within its red soil. This new age of colonization in the solar system will cause a domino effect as it continues to push further advancing with every generation of vessels developed. Travel will get more and more efficient as the Helium-3 will continue to assist in advancing the technology of spacefaring ships. Outposts of all purposes will develop on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, from researching for potential habitability for life on Europa or Enceladus, to continuing the tradition of extracting valuable resources in every location. The Moon will continue to find ways to provide the energy that's needed for terraforming new worlds. It will assist in warming Mars and powering an artificial magnetic field. It will also help with constructing a large reflector that will be able to cool down Venus. All of these will be the foundations for creating further livable locations for future generations of humans, all thanks to that initial source of energy from the Moon. It's difficult to put an overall price tag on the Moon, even when you know that there is value in harvesting its resources.
The value of what the moon dust really amounts to can't be determined by a monetary figure, but by its potential to influence what humans can create as we continue to progress as a species.